This is a recording of Summit Curriculum English 910 Explorations in Literature, page 321. The short story is entitled My Aunt Gold Teeth by V.S. Nepal. I never knew her real name, and it is quite likely that she did have one, though I never heard her called anything but gold teeth. She did indeed have gold teeth. She had 16 of them. She had married early, and she had married well, and shortly after her marriage, she exchanged her perfectly sound teeth for gold ones to announce to the world that her husband was a man of substance. Even without her gold teeth, my aunt would have been noticeable. She was short, scarcely five foot, and she was fat, horribly, monstrously fat. If you saw her in silhouette, you would have found it difficult to know whether she was facing you or whether she was looking sideways. She ate little and prayed much. Her family being Hindu and her husband being a pundit, she too was an Orthodox Hindu. Of Hinduism, she knew little apart from the ceremonies and the taboos, and this was enough for her. Gold teeth saw God as a power, and religious ritual as a means of harnessing that power for great practical good, her good. I fear I may have given the impression that gold teeth prayed because she wanted to be less fat. The fact was that gold teeth had no children, and she was almost forty. It was her childlessness, not her fat, that oppressed her, and she prayed for the curse to be removed. She was willing to try any means, any ritual, any prayer, in order to trap and channel the supernatural power. And so it was that she began to indulge in surreptitious Christian practices. She was living at the time in a country village called Kunupia, a county Caroni. Here, the Canadian mission had long waged war against the Indian heathen and saved many, but gold teeth stood firm. The minister of Kunupia expended his Presbyterian piety on page 322. Her, so did the headmaster of the mission school, but all in vain. At no time was gold teeth persuaded even to think about being converted. The idea horrified her. Her father had been in his day one of the best-known Hindu pundits, and even now her husband's fame as a pundit, as a man who could read and write Sanskrit, had spread far beyond Kunupia. She was in no doubt whatsoever that Hindus were the best people in the world, and that Hinduism was a superior religion. She was willing to select, modify, and incorporate alien eccentricities into her worship, but to abjure her own faith? Never. Presbyterianism was not the only danger the good Hindu had to face in Kunupia, besides, of course, the ever-present threat of open Muslim aggression the Catholics were to be reckoned with. Their pamphlets were everywhere, and it was hard to avoid them. In them gold teeth read of novenas and rosaries, of squads of saints and angels. These were things she understood and could even sympathize with, and they encouraged her to seek further. She read of the mysteries and the miracles of penances and indulgences. Her skepticism sagged and yielded to a quickening, if reluctant, enthusiasm. One morning, she took the train for the county town of Chagunas, three miles, two stations, and twenty minutes away. The Church of St. Philip and St. James in Cagunas stands imposingly at the end of the Coroni Savannah Road, and although Gold Teeth knew Chagunas well, all she knew of the church was that it had a clock, at which she had glanced on her way to the railway station nearby. She had hitherto been far more interested in the drab, ochre-washed edifice opposite, which was the police station. She carried herself into the churchyard, awed by her own temerity, feeling like an explorer in a land of cannibals. To her relief, the church was empty. It was not as terrifying as she had expected. In the gilt and the images and the resplendent cloth, she found much that reminded her of her Hindu temple. Her eyes caught a discreet sign, candles two cents each. 
She undid the knot in the end of her veil, where she kept her money, took out three. Page 323. Cents popped them into the box, picked up a candle, and muttered a prayer in Hindu Stathani. A brief moment of elation gave way to a sense of guilt, and she was suddenly anxious to get away from the church as fast as her weight would let her. She took a bus home and hid the candle in her chest of drawers. She had half feared that her husband's brahminical flair for clairvoyance would have uncovered the reason for her trip to Chagunas. When after four days, which she spent in an ecstasy of prayer, her husband had mentioned nothing. Goldteeth thought it safe to burn the candle. She burned it secretly, at night, before her Hindu images and set up, as she thought, prayers of double eff efficacy. Every day her religion, schizophrenia, grew, and presently she began wearing a crucifix. Neither her husband nor her neighbors knew she did so. The chain was lost in the billows of fat around her neck, and the crucifix was itself buried in the valley of her, her gargantuan breasts. Later she acquired two holy pictures, one of the Virgin Mary, the other of the crucifixion, and took care to conceal them from her husband. The prayers she offered to these Christian things filled her with new hope and buoyancy. She became an addict of Christianity. Then her husband, Ram Prasad, fell ill. Ram Prasad's sudden, unaccountable illness alarmed gold teeth. It was, she knew, no ordinary illness. And she knew, too, that her religious transgression was the cause. The district medical officer at Chagunas said it was diabetes, but Goldteeth knew better. To be on the safe side, though, she used the insulin he prescribed, and to be even safer, she consulted Ganesh Pundit, the masseur with mystic leanings celebrated as a faith healer. Ganesh came all the way from Fentu Grove to Kunupia. He came in great humility anxious to serve Goldteeth's husband, for Goldteeth's husband was a Brahmin among Brahmins, and Pandi, a man who knew all five Vedas, while he, Ganesh, was a mere Chabe and knew only four. Page 324. With a spotless white Korta, his dhoti cannily tied, and a tasseled green scarf as a concession to e elegance, Ganache exuded the confidence of the professional mystic. He looked at the sick man, observed his pallor, sniffed the air inquiringly. This man, he said so slowly, is bewitched. Seven spirits are upon him. She was telling Goldteeth nothing she didn't know. She had known from the first that there were spirits in the affair but she was glad that Ganesh had ascertained their number. You mustn't worry, Ganesh added. We will tie the house in spiritual bonds, and no spirit will be able to come in. Then without being asked, Goldteeth brought out a blanket, folded it, placed it on the floor, and invited Ganesh to sit on it. Next she brought him a brass jar of fresh water, a mango leaf, and a plate full of burning charcoal. Bring me some ghee, Ganesh said, and after gold teeth had done so, he set to work. Muttering continuously in Hindustatani, he sprinkled the water from the brass jar around him with the mango leaf. Then he melted the ghee in the fire, and the charcoal hissed so sharply that gold teeth could not make out his words. Presently he rose and said, You must put some of the ash of this fire on your husband's forehead. But if he doesn't want you to do that, mix it with his food. You must keep the water in this jar and place it every night before your front door. Goldteeth pulled her veil over her forehead. Ganache coughed. That, he said, rearranging his scarf, is all. There is nothing more I can do. God will do the rest. He refused any payment for his services. It was enough honor, he said, for a man as humble as he was to serve Pundit Ram Prasad, as she, Goldteeth, had been singled out by faith to be the spouse of such a worthy man. Goldteeth received the impression that Ganesh spoke from a first-hand knowledge of fate and its 
designs in her heart, buried deep down under inches of mortal flabby flesh, sank a little. Baba, she said hesitantly, revered father, I have something to say to you. But she couldn't say any more, and Ganesh, seeing this, filled his eyes with charity and love. What is it, my child? Page 325. I have done a great wrong, Baba. What sort of wrong, he asked, and his tone indicated that gold teeth could do no wrong. I have prayed to Christian things. And to gold teeth's surprise, Ganesh chuckled benevolently. And do you think God minds, daughter? There is only one God, and different people pray to him in different ways. It doesn't matter how you pray, but God is pleased if you pray at all. So it is not because of me that my husband has fallen ill? No, to be sure, daughter. In his professional capacity, Ganesh was consulted by people of many faiths, and with the license of the mystic, he had exploited the commodiousness of Hinduism and made room for all beliefs. In this way, he had many clients, as he called them, many satisfied clients. Henceforth, Gold Teeth not only pasted Ram Prasad's pale forehead with the sacred ash Ganesh had prescribed, but mixed substantial amounts with his food. Ram Prasad's appetite, enormous even in sickness, diminished, and he shortly entered into a visible and alarming decline that mystified his wife. She fed him more ash than before, and when it was exhausted and Ram Prasad perilously macerated, she fell back on the Hindu wife's last resort. She took her husband home to her mother. That venerable lady, my grandmother, lived with us in Port of Spain in Woodbrook. Ram Prasad was tall and skeletal, and his face was gray. The virile voice that had expounded a thousand theological points and recited a hundred Puranas was now a wavering whisper. We cooped him up in a room called, oddly, the pantry. It had never been used as a pantry, and one can only assume that the architect, in the idealistic manner of his tribe, had so designed it some forty years before. It was a tiny room. If you wished to enter the pantry, you were compelled, as soon as you opened the door, to climb onto the bed. It fitted the room to a miracle. The lower half of the... Page 326. Walls were concrete. The upper, close lattice work. There were no windows. My grandmother had her doubts about the suitability of the room for a sick man. She was worried about the lattice work. It let in air and light and Ram Prasad was not going to die from these things if she could help it. With cardboard, oilcloth, and canvas, she made the lattice work airproof and lightproof. And sure enough, within a week of Ram Prasad's appetite returned, insatiable and insistent as before. My grandmother claimed all the credit for this, though Gold Teeth knew that ash she had fed him had not been without effect. Then she realized with horror that she had ignored a very important thing. The house in Canupia had been tied and no spirits could enter, but the house in Woodbrook had given, been given no such protection and any spirit could come and go as it chose. The problem was pressing. Ganache was out of the question. By giving his services free, he had made it impossible for Gold Teeth to call him in again. But thinking in this way of Ganesh, she remembered his words. It doesn't matter how you pray, but God is pleased if you pray at all. Why not then bring Christianity into play again? She didn't want to take any chances this time. She decided to tell Ram Prasad. He was propped up in bed and eating. When Gold Teeth opened the door, he stopped eating and blinked at the unwanted light. Gold teeth stepping into the doorway and filling it shadowed the room once more, and he went on eating. She placed the palms of her hand on the bed. It creaked. Man, she said. Ram Prasad continued to eat. Man, she said in English. I think about going to the church to pray. You never know, and it's better to be on the safe side. After all, the house here ain't tied. I don't want you to pray in no church, he whispered in English too. Gold Teeth did the only thing she could do. She began to cry. Three days in succession she had asked his permission to go to church, and his opposition weakened in the face of her tears. 
He was now, besides, too weak to oppose anything, although his, page 327, appetite had returned, he was still very ill and very weak, and every day his condition became worse. On the fourth day, he said to Goldteeth, Well, pray to Jesus and go to church, if it will put your mind at rest. And Goldteeth straightway set out about putting her mind at rest. Every morning she took the trolley bus to the Holy Rosary Church to offer worship in her private way. Then she was emboldened to bring a crucifix and pictures of the Virgin and the Messiah into the house. We were all somewhat worried by this. But Gold Teeth's religious nature was well known to us. Her husband was a learned pundit, and when all was said and done, this was an emergency, a matter of life and death. So we could do nothing but look on. Incense and camphor and ghee burned now before the likenesses of Krishna and Shiva, as well as Mary and Jesus. Gold Teeth revealed an appetite for prayer that equaled her husband's for food, and we marveled at both if only because neither prayer nor food seemed to be of any use to Romprasad. One evening, shortly after Bell and Gong and Conkshell had announced that Gold Teeth's official devotions were almost over, a sudden chorus of lamentation burst over the house, and I was summoned to the room reserved for prayer. Come quickly! Something dreadful has happened to your aunt! The prayer room, still heavy with the fumes of incense, presented an extraordinary sight. Before the Hindu shrine, flat on her face, gold teeth lay prostrate, rigid as a sack of flour, a large amorphous mass. I only had seen gold teeth standing or sitting, and the aspect of gold teeth prostrate, so novel and so grotesque, was disturbing. My grandmother, an alarmist by nature, bent down and put her ear to the upper half of the body on the floor. I don't seem to hear her heart, she said. We were all somewhat terrified. We tried to lift gold teeth, but she seemed as heavy as lead. Then slowly the body quivered. The flesh beneath the clothes rippled, then billowed, and the children in the room sharpened their shrieks. Instinctively, we all stood back from the body and waited to see what was going to happen. Gold Teeth's hand began to pound the floor, and at the same time she began to gurgle. Page 328. My grandmother had grasped the situation. She's got the spirit, she said. At the word spirit, the children shrieked louder, and my grandmother slapped them into silence. The gurgling resolved itself into words pronounced with a lingering, ghastly quaver. Hail Mary, Hara Ram, Gold Teeth said. The snakes are after me. Everywhere snakes, seven snakes, Rama, Rama, full of grace. Seven spirits leave in Canupia by the four o'clock train for Port of Spain. My grandmother and my mother listened eagerly. Their faces lit up with pride. I was rather ashamed at the exhibition and annoyed with gold teeth for putting me into a fright. I moved towards the door. Who is that going away? Who is that young Daffar? The unbeliever, the voice asked abruptly. Come back quickly, boy, my grandmother whispered. Come back and ask her pardon. I did as I was told. It is all right, son, Gold Teeth replied. You don't know. You are young. Then the spirit appeared to leave her. She wretched herself up to a sitting position and wondered why we were all there. For the rest of that evening, she behaved as if nothing had happened, and she pretended she didn't notice that everyone was looking at her and treating her with unusual respect. I have always said it, and I will say it again, my grandmother said, that these Christians are very religious people. That is why I encouraged Gold Teeth to pray to Christian things. Ram Prasad died early next morning, and we had the announcement on the radio after the local news at one o'clock. Ram Prasad's death was the only one announced, and so, although it came between commercials, it made some impression. We buried him that afternoon in Mucurapo Cemetery. As soon as we got back, my grandmother said, I have always said it, and I will say it again. I don't like these Christian things. Ram Prasad would have got better if only you, Gold Teeth. Page 329 had listened to me and not gone running after these Christian things. Gold Teeth sobbed her assent, and her body squabbered and shook as she confessed the whole story of her trafficking with Christianity. 
We listened in astonishment and shame. We didn't know that a good Hindu and a member of our family could sink so low. Gold Teeth beat her breast and pulled ineffectually at her long hair and begged to be forgiven. It is all my fault, she cried. My own fault, Ma. I fell in a moment of weakness. Then I just couldn't stop. My grandmother's shame turned to pity. It's all right, Gold Teeth. Perhaps it was this you needed to bring you back to your senses. That evening, Gold Teeth ritually destroyed every reminder of Christianity in the house. You have only to blame yourself, my grandmother said. If you have no children now to look after you...